Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Those of you here for the 215 conversation with Rich Frank and Rob Satino, please find your seats. Those of you who are visiting the U.S. Freedom Pavilion and didn't know about today's program, you're more than welcome to stay. It'll be an engaging conversation on this important 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. If I could ask you to please find your uh, cell phones and silent them or turn them off so they don't interrupt today's conversation, that'd be greatly appreciated. And a reminder, 30 minutes after this program, we'll have another great panel discussion from 3.45 to 5.15, I'm sorry, to 5 o'clock on the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Mike Bell, the Executive Director of the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. After today's, uh, uh, this morning's moving and meaningful ceremony, we at the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy wanted to put uh, events uh, that occurred 80 years ago today in even greater context. So thanks for joining us here with that. Uh, we've got kind of three events. This is the first of the three. Uh, and you're, of course, are welcome to come to more. And if you see folks out there, tell them to come on in. Uh, certainly, before we get started, I'd like to ask any World War II veterans or Holocaust survivors, home front workers, uh, both here and at home. Uh, if they're not here, let's just give them a round of applause anyway. <laughs> 
And then in the, the tradition of the museum here, uh, any veterans or active duty, you know, would you please stand and, or wave so we can acknowledge your uh, service and sacrifice as well. That was a quick stand. That was really good. <laughs> hey, um, yeah, I used to teach uh, history at West Point, and, and the hardest class was the one after lunch. You know, it was, it was always challenging because you're up against, you know, the shepherd's pot fire or whatever. So what we've got here is a super exciting uh, slate for you, uh, starting with uh, or featuring one of the museum's longest serving advisors and friends, uh, Rich Frank. And Rich's connection to the museum goes way back to 2006, possibly before that, uh, you know, long before I was even connected. You know, we were busy doing other things, but he was a founding member of the Presidential uh, Counselor's Advisory Board, a member of our International Conference Planning Committee, the one we just had last month. He's the chief uh, external historical consultant for the Road to Tokyo exhibit, which is uh, super amazing. He's been the lead for some of our summer teacher institutes, and he serves as a feature tour historian on many of our overseas educational travel programs. He's the author of Guadalcanal, which you'll see over there, Downfall, uh, MacArthur. I know she didn't feature a MacArthur book over there. And then finally, the book that's the feature of today's conversation, Tower of Skulls, a History of the Asia-Pacific War is the first book in his trilogy on the Asia-Pacific War. Rich is also a combat veteran, uh, served with the 101st uh, Division in Vietnam. So Rich, thanks for your service and sacrifice as well. <laughs> Air Salt. And uh, Rich will be joined on stage by Dr. Rob Satino. He's our, our very own Samuel Zamuri Stone senior historian, uh, the author of 10 books himself, and certainly a great teammate and wingman at the Institute for the Study of Modern Democracy. So gentlemen, please join me on stage and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. It's always a moment of truth. Oh, yes, the moment of truth, good. Thanks everyone, and, and Mike, thank you for your, for your kind words. Um, Mike's been here Seven weeks now, I, I think. Five. Five seems like it seems like twenty years yet, Mike. Does it? You, you fit right. You, you fit this place like a glove. It's been great. Rich Frank, it's always wonderful to have you here at the National World War II Museum. You and I um, share a moment in time. My first trip to the History Channel, my first appearance on the History Channel. You and I were talking about air power, and we had to break it down to a, I think a five-second soundbite at the end. Something something like that. And I learned at the feet of the master. Um. <laughs> Well, my view on uh, all those video productions is it's important to have a good editor who can save you from all your mistakes. <laughs> By the end, I remember saying air power. Part of the puzzle, yes. The whole story, no way. And I, I said I've just destroyed my entire reputation as an intellectual. <laughs> somehow it is, somehow I've endured. Um, so today we're here to talk to Rich about his uh, current book. That is Tower of Skulls, A History of the Asia-Pacific War, July 1937 to May 19. 40, uh, 42. Rich, um, a question I uh, almost always like to start with, especially with good authors. Tell us about the genesis of this book. And let me explain. R Rich talks about the Asia-Pacific War. So Americans know a lot about one of those wars, and that's the Pacific side. The, the Asia side, not so much. What, what place does this gigantic land war in Asia hold in American consciousness? Well, I said the short answer is not the place it should, and that's part of the reason why I wrote the book. Um, in a way, I sort of built up to this. Uh, the first book I published was a campaign study about Guadalcanal. The second book was Downfall. It was about the end of the war, which really uh, led me to believe that there's a lot more than the military d dimensions of the war. You have to cover politics, and you know, there was code breaking and all kinds of other things. And uh, then I did a short bio of MacArthur, and I was looking around for another topic. And I've been mulling on this for quite some time that uh, there's this whole gigantic story about what happened in China and throughout the Asian continent that had not been covered for various reasons we could maybe get into later or whatever here. And I realized that, and other historians have been there before also, is that, you know, really when we, f we frame it up, uh, we got into a habit of framing it up as the Pacific War, the conflict between the U.S. and Japan, a maritime war across the Pacific between December 41 and and basically August, September 1945. But there was a whole preamble to this starting in China in 37, 
and then extending uh, across the Asian continent after Japan attacked us because they were going elsewhere in Asia. And the final aspect about this was reading John Dower's War Without Mercy in 1986, which is a very important book, but one of the things in that book was at the end, and it doesn't get quoted very often, he says, well, he was gonna tally up what the cost of the war was, and he says, well, I think the Japanese non-combatant deaths in the war were a million. He says, and then there were nine million uh, Chinese non-combatants who died, four million Indonesians who died, a million Vietnamese who died. So, you know, that's for every Japanese non-combatant who died, there were, by his count at that point, there were 14 other non-combatants who had died. And I thought, that is such an, a fundamental element of this part of World War II, which is so almost completely unknown. Later, during the war though, I would argue that the Americans were well aware actually of what was going on. So my work is, is not so much revisionism, but sort of restoration of mm -hmm. taking us back in the way the people who lived through the war saw it, and they saw it in full. It was a global struggle touching not just this specific war but in Europe, but also this immense war on the Asian continent. You know, I think that there might be something to that about historians, revisionism, restorationism. Often what we call revisionism, so we're changing the way people think about this, is often kind of a, a return to the sort of the, the radical root of the matter, the way it was perceived at the time, and I think that th you do have something to say about that in this book. Yeah, I do. And one other thing I've been doing, uh, which I highly recommend if, if, if you have the t life lifespan and the time to do this, I've been reading the New York Times day by day through the war, because the Times was, of course, a leading paper. It covered both domestic and international politics very well, and, and every single day, uh, the front page would have a headline on page two, uh, because of the, they, what they viewed their role at that time as sort of the paper of record, they'd print the communiques from all the major combatants from the day before. And you, what really comes through with that is that they understood it was a global war, that there was not only a European phase, but there was an Asia Pacific phase, and even you might say an African phase over mm -hmm. here. So you get all of that coming from the Times. The Times was read by American elites, certainly in Washington. It was the template for news coverage virtually throughout the country at that time. So what you're looking at when you're looking at what the New York Times is covering is echoing all the way through the country. And once again, that really brought home to me that this whole issue of, you know, it was a global war with this huge dimension on the Asian continent as well as in the Pacific, and that very much reinforced it. And it's, it's a wonderful, it, it just recapturing how it felt at the time. Of course, you have to be careful you get too distracted by reading the first reviews of the movie Casablanca yeah. <laughs> and looking at housing prices in New York City in 1942, you know. Uh, Pound like of meat at Heinen's, whatever, whatever right, it is. Right, to you right, to, right. I, I know that problem with primary sources. Right. Um, so in the Asia Pacific War, let's get back to that term. Uh, tell us about the origins of this war, Rich. Uh, Japan had already lopped off portions of China, notably Manchuria, but why in July 1937? does Japan decide on a full-scale invasion of what we still, I guess, call China proper? What is the Marco Polo Bridge incident? Well, uh, one of the issues about dealing with Imperial Japan is understanding how incredibly dysfunctional military and political decision-making was in Japan because of factionalism within the, civil gov within the civilian government between and within the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy. And, and quite fundamentally, it's very difficult to talk about Imperial Japan as having making comprehensive long-range plans. Mm -hmm. It's very much uh, situation to situation or whatever here. Uh, really to get to the Marco Polo Bridge, I think you have to look at it from the Chinese side. And to understand that, you have to go back to 1931 when Manchuria is overrun. And we know now because of this tremendous flourishing of evidence from China that we simply did not have until the, at the earliest the 1980s when archival documents and Chiang Kai-shek's diaries are released in 2006. What happened then was that the Japanese uh, faction of radical officers in the Imperial Army, without orders from Tokyo, seized Manchuria. And a Japanese prime minister who uh, opposed that was assassinated, and that was the end of any significant civilian input into the Japanese government at the, at the prime minister level, or any level for that matter. Uh, on the Chinese side, Zhang Kai-shek at that time had risen to be the, the premier leader among a group. He really should always be viewed, viewed as leading a coalition, uh, not just the Nationalist Party versus the Communists. It was always a coalition uh, 
that Zhang was leading. And Chang recognized in 1931 that uh, he was, like all Chinese leaders, very upset about the loss of Manchuria, but he was a soldier, a trained soldier. He recognized that they really were in no position to really challenge the Japanese with a full-scale war at that time. And he also came to the uh, conclusion that to restore Chinese sovereignty and, and uh, unify the nation and restore its greatness, it was going to be ultimately necessary to have a showdown war with Imperial Japan. But once again, he understood that China was in no position in 31 to do that. It was going to take substantial preparation, both on the military side, the civilian side, all kinds of elements. And we know now that from 1931, uh, without at first advertising this, he was embarked upon this massive program to get ready for this showdown war. He was criticized within China because he did not seem to be actively resisting the Japanese as they continued to subvert Chinese uh, sovereignty in other provinces of China. Uh, but when you have the records, you know that, in fact, he was keen on finding the moment to have the war. In fact, he gave a speech in 1934 when he said, you know, we're only 1,000 days from war with Japan. He was, he was off by like 43 days oh or whatever here at that point. So in July 1937, when another uh, small skirmish breaks out among many that had taken place, but the Japanese seem to show signs that they really want to use this as an excuse to assert, uh, take away Chinese sovereignty all the way down to Beijing. And at that moment, Shang decides that uh, the Japanese uh, can't be permitted to go that far or he will lose totally the, his leading position. Or whatever. And he really decides that this is going to now go to full-scale war and the Japanese reciprocate and tremendous fighting breaks out. So that, that's fascinating to me. I've, I was brought up on a diet of a sort of passive Zhang. Zhang Kai-shek never really acting, uh, and if he ever did act, it was almost always too late and, and too little, and that, that this was some sort of a, a Japanese-driven event. But you've sort of restored this Marco Polo Bridge and, it's an, and thus this second Sino-Japanese war, as we call it, that there's at least as much Chinese agency as there is Japanese. Very much so, very much so. And, and, let me just, um, we'll, we'll probably get to some of this a little later. What was what really critical in all of this, that really was a complete ja game changer, is that Chiang Kai-shek's personal diaries were released from Taiwan and now reside at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. And as uh, one of our colleagues, Mark Stoller, has mm -hmm. been with us on uh, programs with us, he was talking to a historian from the People's Republic of China, and, and he said, that scholar said, you know, these diaries change everything. And they're foundational now to what we understand about Zhang. It's hard to it's hard to have a passive figure once you're reading his diary or yeah. her diary. It, they're acting, they're thinking, they're doing. They're, they're get, they seem they seem much more vital characters than a sort of passive cardboard Zhang. Yeah, and I mean he has passages in there where he says, you know, okay, uh, we're we're going to get into a full scale war with with Japan. Uh, this is going to lead to a world war, and in the world war we will have allies which will be able to complete the defeat of Japan which China is incapable of doing at that point. They could hold on to China, but they could not subdue Japan. We will get to a point where we'll have allies that can, well, that's visionary yeah. in the mid-1930s. This is how he's seeing how history is going to unfold, and he's telling it exactly how it unfolds. So full-scale war breaks out between the Japanese and the Chinese. I have to think the Japanese expected a kind of rapid victory. That had certainly been their battlefield history. They had fought China once before in the 1890s. They'd fought Russia famously in 0405. Both pretty rapid victories. The Russian a little more difficult. Um, but what about, what about their expectations for this war they were now in with the Chinese? What, what, how'd they think it was going to go, Rich? Well, for that, you have to go back and acknowledge that it was not just uh, the Japanese not understanding what they were embarking upon. What the Ch Chinese uh, now called the century of humiliation it begun in 1839 with the first Opium War. And in that interval from 1839 to 98 years later in 1937, no central Chinese government had managed to wage sustained war against a westernized power, typically for more than a few months and no more than a year. And so the Chinese were by no means, uh, the, excuse me, the Japanese were by no means uh, full of the expectation that as soon as they committed serious forces to combat in China, the Chinese uh, military forces would be routed and the Chinese government would become a supplicant to whatever terms. Uh, I I in fact, there's sort of this black humor moment uh, 
because when the fighting breaks out in Shanghai, which is where the first huge battle takes place, the biggest battle in an urban center before Stalingrad in 1942, and the New York Times has, because we're neutral, the New York Times has reporters on the Japanese side and the Chinese side. Well, the, the battle goes on first for days and then for weeks and then for months. And it confounds the uh, expectations not only of the Japanese but also throughout the world. In fact, there's a, there was an article in the New York Times saying that, well, this showed that the Japanese weren't all they were cracked up to be because they couldn't route the Chinese in a, f in a few weeks right. or whatever. So this New York Times reporter asked a uh, Japanese Imperial Army officer, uh, who was the what we now call the spin doctor for the Imperial Army. That's and his the, official title. His That's official his title, right. I, the Japanese translation. <laughs> <or whatever. laughs> yes. And he says, you know, well, how come, he says, basically, how come you haven't already routed the Chinese like it's been happening for the Chinese for a century? And the, and the Japanese officer says, well, you have to understand the Chinese know so little of tactics, they don't know when to retreat. Yeah. So I thought that's a classic of spin. That's <laughs> so the, you already, you already uh, uh, used the term, the uh, expectations confound. Or, uh, Japanese expecting some kind of easy victory as they, they believe themselves to be a modern, sort of westernized, if not western, power. And that kind of army usually made short work of the Chinese. At what point did the Japanese know they're, I'll enter another word that is often used here, at what point did the Japanese know they're in a quagmire? That they, they, they can't really get out of China, they can't really finish the China war, they got most of their army stuck there. At what point does that happen, Rich? Yeah, that's an excellent point, because what happens between July, August of 37, and uh, October of 1938, is there's a series of very large scale conventional battles that take place in China, first in Shanghai, uh, then uh, tracking up the Yangtze River to Nanjing, which is the capital of the Nationalist Party at that time. And of course, in Nanjing, the Japanese commit one of the great, most famous atrocities of the war. And then in 1938, there's this extended campaign concerning the Wuhan cities, which you've probably heard about recently Indeed. in other contexts or whatever, which Zhang has moved his military headquarters to. And it's about 800 miles inland on the Yangtze River. Ocean-going ships can get to Wuhan in 1938. And in this extended campaign that extends through the summer, uh, there's tremendous fighting. Uh, uh, the Japanese have, of course, much superior air, have air superiority, and of course they have heavy naval support coming up the Yangtze. They fight their way up. Chinese casualties, again, as they had been from the beginning, are much, much heavier than the Japanese casualties. And the Japanese finally get to the Wuhan cities and capture them in October. And in uh, Tokyo, at the headquarters of Imperial uh, Headquarters, uh, a, a secret war diary kept there by the operations section, they finally, they write in their war diary at, at that point in September, October 19, uh, excuse me, October, November 1938, uh, that now they recognize they cannot win the war against China by military means alone. They're in a quagmire. So they reckon, uh, that was sort of a revelation too, that the Japanese realized as early as they're only, what, 15, 16 months into the war, mm -hmm. and they already realize they're in a quagmire right over here. But loss of face, they're not, they're not gonna simply call it quits and, and pull out. They're gonna try other strategies to undermine the, the nationalists. And one of the things that's also gone on is the Japanese have you know, inflicted tremendous damage on Zhang's central uh, army right over here, which suffered tremendous loss, including the officer corps, and that's gonna tell throughout the war. But the one thing that Zhang has done which he had intended to do was that although militarily the Chinese have lost almost every battle, they, they do win a couple, which are very important, but what they've done is they've shown that Chinese forces can uh, put forward effective sustained military resistance, which had not been done for a century. And politically, this is huge in China, that he rallies the population to the notion that they're not gonna quit, mm -hmm. and if they keep going, they'll win. I've compared it sometimes to the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill, right? Sure. We lose the battle, but the sense of if we persist and keep after this, we can still ultimately triumph. And that's exactly what happens in China between 37 and 38. You know, I studied the Germans, and believe me, you can, you can win your way to defeat. Right. <laughs> the Germans win a lot of victories, <laughs> battlefield victories in World War II, in the, even in the Soviet Union. But of course, we all know, we all know how that ended. So. You know, one of the points that you make in this book, Rich, and I was talking to you beforehand, 
I think the most interesting portions of your argument here are those that deal with China's internal situation, which you're just beginning to address. <clears throat> and I mean particularly the relationship between Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader, and the Chinese communists, of course, under, under Mao. I've read 100 books on China in this period, and every one of them tells me that, uh, that Zhang was corrupt, that he did very little fighting, that his troops sat around, uh, that he saved weapons for the upcoming civil war of the communists, that the communists alone were the ones who were taking the fight to the Japanese. But you don't believe that, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. Um, I, t I tell you, um, there was sort of a synergy with respect to the release of additional records from the PR PRC and Zhang's diaries. And a really excellent historian, Jay Taylor, out of Harvard, uh, in looking at uh, records, uh, decided, you know, a really good idea would be to go to uh, Moscow to look in the reports of the Comintern, because every good Communist Party at that time turned in its annual or semi-annual reports about what they'd been up to. And Taylor went there, and uh, two uh, records in particular he, he found. One was a report by the Chinese Communist Party about how the war had been going from July of 37 to about, it's a little unclear, but it's about August of September 1938. Mm -hmm. And they say, during this period, Chinese military forces have sustained a million casualties, which is probably reasonably correct. And of the combatant forces, uh, the Red Army, the Chinese Red Army, they've sustained 31,000. Do the math on that. And you can't get from that math to the notion that the Chinese communists are carrying the main burden. Now, there's a lot of ways to ele elaborate on this point, but that is, uh, I think, one of the most stellar single facts. And then in 1944, there's a similar report. By that time, Chinese military casualties are somewhere in the two, three, a little over three million total. And a December 1944 report that's sort of on the parallel to that says uh, casualties in the Red Army to that point are 100,000. Again, they're a small fraction of the total. I'm not arguing that the Chinese Communists were doing no fighting, but they were doing guerrilla war. They spent a good deal of their time against uh, puppet forces or whatever here. They were not engaged in large-scale conventional fighting against uh, the nationalists. Mm -hmm. So the, the notion that the, the Chinese Communist part, Armed Forces were carrying the war and the nationalists were not at all, you know, it's just, it's almost an inversion of reality. The other thing that, that comes through is, uh, and, and let me say again, you know, I, I was steeped exactly in, you know, I, I Edward, want, Edward Snow, the uh, yeah, Ed, Ed, all this Red stuff. Star Over China. Yeah, and the same same story we've been told for a long time. And uh, I went in assuming that the, that was kind of the baseline narrative I was going to follow. And, I, and believe me, you know, uh, you talk about cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. when you're first dealing with right. hitting being hit by facts that, that are mind-boggling in the other direction. And at first... Honestly, you go through this phase of, mm, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe this stuff is as skewed as the other stuff or worse. And then uh, gradually it really hits you. And then I, then I was told that, you know, even in the PRC among historians, there's this recognition uh, among them that what the real story is. Now, the, the current regime is trying to change that story, but that's very true. The other thing is that uh, in when the war breaks out in 37, the Chinese communists and Mao had just finished the Long March, as they call it, and they end up in this area in northwest China, which even by Chinese standards is impoverished, and China's population is about 450 million, and the area under Mao's immediate control at that time is like 1.45 million people, which is like three-tenths of 1% in 1937. Now, the long arc of this narrative, and I, I'm going through, especially in volumes two and three, is, is the incredible rise of the Chinese Communists, both politically and militarily, to 1945 when they've got about a million party members and about 900,000 men under arms or whatever here. So the, the, the mm -hmm. dynamic of that is dramatically different. It's, it's a dramatic story. Well, you have to save something for books two and three of the trilogy. So. Well, that's, I'm <laughs> saving up. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's shift over to the Pacific side of the Asia-Pacific War. Uh, let's talk about Pearl Harbor a bit, Rich. You write uh, in, in Tower of Skulls, for Japan, the transcendent strategic goal in 1941 was ending the China War. But of course, we know that's not what happens. They pick another fight, and this time with the United States. How are Japan's war in China and, and the decision to attack Pearl Harbor, how are those things related? Well, I, I think uh, you have to go back, and even though the 
the Japanese recognized that they were in a quagmire in China they couldn't end themselves. And even though they had had a very uh, sobering brush with Soviet forces in 1939 in, in Manchuria, uh, from their perspective, uh, they appeared to have uh, enlisted on the winning team. Because what you have to understand is when you really run through the whole list of events, from I would say from October 35 when Italy rolls into Ethiopia, up to literally through the summer of 1942, if you just list uh, all these events, and I cover this in my prologue in volume two, is you know, the Axis powers are triumphing almost every single time. Stunning victories, humiliating victories to the Allies. There are very few moments when the anti-Axis forces are enjoying a triumph. And the, the two that uh, immediately come to mind in this span are uh, Great Britain's survival during the summer of 1940, uh, and then the Soviets uh, holding out in front of Moscow and other places on the Eastern Front in uh, November, December, into early parts of 1942. But the problem was, if you were looking at the world at that time and what you knew at that time, neither the survival of Great Britain nor the survival of the Soviet Union looked like an, a, a complete deliverance. It was not clear that these were merely reprieves. Mm -hmm. And from the Japanese standpoint, when they're taking on the U.S., they're not just thinking of a matchup between themselves and the U.S. They're thinking of the Axis powers, particularly their German ally. Uh, is going to absorb a great proportion of the American effort, and they basically uh, discount uh, the Americans in, in, in important ways. The, the final element to this, and I get into this in, in Tower of Skulls, which uh, has not yet uh, taken fire among other historians the way I would like, but one of the most important things I think- Well, to let's put it out there right now. Right, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a vote on it. <laughs> so one, of the th one of the things I've tried to do in Tower of Skulls and the whole trilogy is I keep looking back and forth between this Asia Pacific War and that European War. How do they either affect or not affect each other? What are the connections? And one of the ones, by taking that really global look, instead of looking at 1941 between the US and Japan, and simply looking at, well, what, what are the U.S. pursuing, what are the Japanese pursuing? I look globally and realize President Roosevelt recognized Nazi Germany as the ultimate existential threat. The Japanese were a threat, but not remotely at that level. Uh, in the summer of 1941, when Hitler attacks the Soviet Union, at first, in London and Washington, everyone expects the Soviets are gonna fold up like every other major target right. the Germans have attacked. And for the first several weeks, that's exactly the way it looks. And then in the last 10 days of July of 1941, the front stabilizes. The Germans have driven, driven very deep in the Soviet Union, but now the front is stabilized. And for the first time, a realistic prospect appears to exist. The Soviets will stay on fighting the Germans as an ally. Strategically, this is at the very top of the list of any strategic, strategically important uh, event of the war to date. And the question in both Washington and London is, you know, what, what can we do? Well, the short answer is, well, the British are overextended, or stretched, and we're unready. The logistics of getting things to the Soviet Union in 1941 are terrible. But the one thing that they both identify as critical is that they believe that if the Japanese come into the war attacking in the Far East against the Soviets, that might be the knockout blow against the Soviets. And how do you prevent that? Well, you keep the Japanese tied down in China. So suddenly there's this linkage in their strategic vision of FDR and Churchill that China is critical to save the Soviet Union, to keep the Soviet Union in the war, to ultimately beat By Nazi keeping Germany. the Japanese out of the war, at least out of the Soviet war. Right, yeah, right, right, keeping them out of the war. So uh, the continued existence of China, the continued participation of China as a combatant becomes critical, and this runs headlong into the supreme Japanese strategic goal which is ending the quagmire in China. So uh, almost immediately you see that th the likelihood of us agreeing with the Japanese at this point uh, on anything is remote to begin with. And the Japanese, their negotiating stance is they want us either to help impose upon China a, a peace that would clearly show Japan had won, the Chinese were defeated, probably almost certainly leading to the collapse of Zhang and the resistance uh, against Japan or they want us to abandon China in the belief that abandoned China will be a defeated China shortly. And of course, these two propositions we're not gonna agree to. So uh, m moving on, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm throwing your own words at you. Oh. 
Frank. <laughs> here's, so here's what I think about a lot. Was there any chance that then that a war between the US and Japan could have been avoided? And you write, quite fundamentally, it's more or less the argument you just presented, the irreducible American and Japanese strategic objectives in the fall of 1941 could not be reconciled. So you, you don't, there's no alternate history that you, you perceive as, shall we say, likely that the United States and Japan could have somehow stopped short of war in 1941. No, it, especially given the nature of the Japanese military and political decision making at that point, I just don't see any realistic prospect that the Japanese were prepared to accept anything uh, that remotely approached our idea of, of how a, a settlement should go. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing, I the one other thing I would add to this, there's a moral dimension to this. I mean, the China is, uh, next to the Soviet Union, as far as we can tell. Uh, Chinese deaths in the Asia-Pacific War, uh, I go by Rana Mitter of Oxford and his wonderful book, Forgotten Ally. And Rana says that the likely totals for Chinese deaths in the war are 14 million to 20 million. And the 14 million figure is 2 million military and 12 million non-combatants. I, I slightly modify that. I think when you, when you figure in deaths due to disease in the Chinese military force, I, I go to 15 million. I just nudge it up a little bit. Or, and there are other people who say Chinese military deaths are two to four million, so I'm not going on a limb on that either. Mm -hmm. But basically, 15 million dead between uh, July 1937, August 1945. And when you, when you work out the math on just a linear basis, by mid-1941, there are about seven and a half million Chinese dead in the war to date. That's way more than the Germans have killed uh, anywhere to that particular point. The Germans get going, really going, after they attack the Soviet Union in terms of mega deaths or whatever here. So, and we're also providing the Japanese with 75 to 80 percent of petroleum for their civilian economy. So in a way, and Roosevelt was very aware of that, in a way, uh, we are morally complicit in what's going on. And that plus the fact that he's afraid that if he cuts off oil prior to July of 41, that the Japanese will turn around and march down and seize the oil in the, in the Dutch East Indies, why he's not prepared to go there, because he doesn't want the U.S. to get into war with Japan and not get into war with Germany. Ideally, it's only against Germany and hold off the Japanese. But in July 1941, I think part of what the oil embargo is about is if you think a Japanese attack on the Soviet Union is going to be a catastrophic strategic error by the Allies, do you give the Japanese the petroleum to make the attack? I mean, that's pretty simple thinking or whatever here. Right. This is fascinating stuff. There's layers and layers of it, and it all comes back to Gerhard Weinberg's admonition that we always remember that the Earth is round, that, that all these the things that are happening in Europe are affecting what's happening in Asia and, and, and vice versa. So, Rich, you're, you're painting a picture of uh, two powers who are being kind of drawn into conflict. The issue, the issue is China. The Americans want the Japanese out of China, and the Japanese want to stay in China, and, and uh, those two things are reconcilable. We're <coughs> embargoing various raw materials on the Japanese, those are very famous. You already mentioned oil in the summer of 1941. How are the Japanese reacting to these things? And I mean this in a specific way. We've cracked the dip Japanese diplomatic code, haven't we? Are we reading their mail? Are we, are we reading, are there signs in the air of an impending war between Japan and the United States? Oh, right, there's, uh, uh, let me state one thing to begin with. We're not breaking the Japanese naval codes. We don't, it, we, we're not, I'll put it this way. What little penetration we've had of Japanese naval codes did not permit us to, quote, read messages. There's just not enough uh, code groups that have been uh, uh, properly identified that you can actually read a message. Mm -hmm. I said that, you know, what we got is, like, if you took a page of text, like 400 words, maybe seven of them on that page would be readable. You're not going to get intelligence out of that or whatever here. We're not getting it, but against the Japanese diplomatic code, or actually it's a cipher machine, a mechanical cipher machine, we are getting a very high grade material. But uh, honestly, uh, if you were just reading the New York Times, you got a full <laughs> sense of what was going on and right. we, that things were closing in. Uh, early today I talked about there's this Gallup poll that closes on the 6th of December 41, and, you know, will we soon be at war with Japan? And 52% of the American people in this sample say yes. You know, so people are extremely aware that we've got down to this critical impasse with the Japanese and war is indeed likely at that point. So on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese, as we say in the business, roll the iron dice and go to war with the 
with the United States. So if the China war, Rich, was the, was the cause of Pearl Harbor, and I think we can kind of say that, it's, I think it's only logical to ask, what was the effect of Pearl Harbor? The fact that the US was now at war with Japan, what was the effect of Pearl Harbor on the China war? It had to have been a big boost for Chinese morale, wasn't it? Very, very much so. Um, in fact, that's, that's a, sort of a, a sub-controversy or whatever. I th what you have to understand, what I've come to understand is the problem that the Chinese have, uh, I call it the, the most important naval campaign of World War II you've never heard of. Uh, part of the Japanese effort from 1937 is that they launch a, a naval blockade of the Chinese Pacific coast, and then in uh, 1942, they're going to take Burma and cut off what's called the Burma Road, which is the last land link to China. The effect of the blockade is much more far-reaching than would immediately appear apparent. The most fundamental point is that for uh, a long time before Zhang became the leader of the central government, the Chinese central government had depended upon um, uh, customs duties for 48% of its revenue. And when the Japanese blockade the coast or occupy these ports, and they also occupy other important populated and basically advanced areas in China, uh, based on what the Chinese revenue was up to uh, the, their financial year, uh, fiscal year ended just before the war began, uh, basically what happens is about 67% of the total revenue going to the central government of China goes away. Just cut off immediately. It's cut off uh, immediately from, well, in two years from yeah. 1938. But there, and the Chinese, to continue the war, uh, they can either you know, give in or they can print money. They start printing money, and that leads to inflation. And that's going to become really the most poisonous thing that's going to undermine the nationalists. It's also going to basically impede everything they attempt to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they run through the, their stockpiles of munitions and their ability to sustain conventional war becomes very low ebb. And then the U.S. comes into the war, and for the first time, uh, the Chinese, this is the, this is the event that Zhang had envisioned, right? Allies who were he going to He said so Japan. long ago in his diary. Right, right, right. And now, however, what immediately happens is those wonderful new allies, the Americans, the Brits, are having their tail ends kicked all over Asia and the Pacific, or whatever here. They lose Burma, or whatever here. And initial Chinese optimism about how the, this will be the big turn of the war and things are going to get better, instead of getting better, they get worse You know, for the first several months. So if you're looking at it from the Chinese standpoint, that what they thought they were going to uh, re, uh, achieve, what the war was going to go to, to their advantage, turns out for quite some time to be a disaster. So after Pearl Harbor, uh, e even in the, that a difficult six months after Pearl Harbor, China is now an ally. Uh, uh, Capital A, it was a member of the Allied Powers. It's no longer alone. It's part of a vast global effort, theoretically, to smash the Axis. In your considered view, Rich, and you've looked at this stuff probably more than any human being alive, at least anyone that I know, was China treated uh, equally and equitably by its Allied partners during the war? Uh, a lot of Americans would have said yes. The Chinese would have a rather contrary view to that. Um, uh, one thing that was done, and uh, you, what you have to understand is uh, Franklin Roosevelt's vision for World War II had a very heavy political component into a post-war world. And that post-war world would be, dominant. there'd be an a, a international organization, the United Nations. There would also be what he called the four policemen. And one of the four policemen was going to be China. So he had this very important role for China to perform post-war. And we now know, uh, some recent scholarship really shows that that thinking had permeated the leadership of the U.S. Navy very heavily. And went, now it's a whole new way of looking at Admiral King's thoughts about the Pacific War, mm -hmm. because he intended to, to conduct operations to get to the Chinese coast to basically establish supplies back to China to refurbish China as an ally or whatever it is. So that's, that's a very fundamental thing. But for a long time, we're, we are unable to do anything. I mean. We uh, eventually reduced to trying to fly supplies to China over what's called the hump, which is uh, a, a extremely perilous route. A lot of airmen die doing it. But from when it got, runs from May of 42 to, I think it's October of 1945, before they finally close it down, we fly in about 740-some thousand tons, so sort of rounding up, okay? If you work that out by month, 
and you divide that by a liberty ship load, which is 7,800 tons by weight, that's about two and a fraction liberty ships per month for 44 months. Mm -hmm. That's what we're shipping to China. Mm -hmm. And more than uh, about half or so goes to aviation activities, Chenault and the 14th Air Force or whatever here. A fellow who wrote a, the best book about the hump, John Plating, an Air Force officer, said that, well, when we finally get into high gear, we, we're flying a lot more to China in 44 and 45. He says, but by that point, out of every 100 tons we're flying over the hump, only about three pounds end up with Chiang Kai-shek's forces or whatever here. So the notion we were sending all this stuff to China, when you work, do, do the math, it, you know, it's, it's really stunning you know, in terms of how little we're getting there. Plus, we keep making promises to do this, and the British keep making promises to open up Burma, whatever here. And that goes on for, you know, basically into 1945 before that's finally done. So from the Chinese standpoint, in fact, FDR comments at one point in 43, I believe, he says, every promise we've made to the Chinese, we've broken. FDR said that. Yes, yes. That's how much, from the Chinese standpoint, this does not seem to be, like, a really good deal. Mm -hmm. You know, Richard, it always seemed to me that when I look at Imperial Japan's plans for war, I, I know military planning, I study it, they seem pretty logical. Point A flows into point B and, and, and C and D and so forth. But it seems to me they missed a key factor the Japanese did in their planning. And that was the impact of Pearl Harbor on American public opinion, the man or woman in the street, if you will, or coming out of a football game, or wherever right. they might have been right. when they heard it. If I were to say that Japan lost the war the moment the first bomb fell on Pearl Harbor, am I exaggerating? I think you could make a solid argument to that. I, I think there was a moment in the summer of 45 uh, when we realized that our, our in-game plan at that point, uh, this Operation Downfall to go and invade Kyushu, suddenly we realized the Japanese had exactly anticipated that. And there's deep concern in Washington about, uh, in effect, war worryingness. And they think that the polling showed that the people are saying in a poll to a poll, you know, we support pursuing this to the end. They think that's very shallow, and they're worried about it. But I think basically there was this resolve that we were eventually going to settle up with Japan. There was not going to be any negotiated peace. It was going to be unconditional surrender. I think, you know, that was the, the driving ideal for American people uh, throughout that period. You know, I think that part of the part of the Japanese calculus was that <coughs> no American president who wished to be reelected could ask the um, American military to fight its way island by island and atoll by atoll across the vastness of the Pacific Ocean, taking 10,000 losses every time out, uh, and, and sometimes many, many more than that. Yeah. That at some point the Ameri American morale would fold, if not the American people themselves. In, insofar as they had a, a war plan, uh, that was the essence of it, was the notion that they would strike out first in this opening offensive sweep, which was stunningly I mean, it's, it's a masterpiece, really, in terms of what they put together in economy of force and speed and coordination, one of the few times when the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy work, like, really close together. Uh, but the idea was they were going to then establish this defensive perimeter, and then uh, they expected a counterattack by the U.S., but they thought, okay, the U.S. will uh, come island by island, but eventually, simply by putting up ferocious resistance and in running up American casualties, mm -hmm. they're going to wear us down, and then we'll agree to negotiate a peace. One of the problems we have in 1945 in trying to persuade the Japanese to end the war is that their exaggeration of the casualties they're inflicting goes from being pretty high to being almost unbelievable in 44, 45. If the leadership in Tokyo uh, realizes it's exaggerated, but they don't begin to realize how high it is. They have this notion that in 1945, they think, well, we have eroded their will to a very significant degree, and that's why they think they've got an in-game strategy that can finally push it over the top and, and, and succeed. The other thing I, I love is there was a biography of Admiral Yamamoto written by a guy named Agawa, and uh, when he came to the section of the book, and the Japanese were just about to attack Pearl Harbor, and of course Admiral Yamamoto was not available for comment, so Agawa turned to one of uh, 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 Yamamoto's classmates of the Naval Academy, guy named Inoue, and says, well, why, why did Japan take this fatal step? And being a solid Imperial Navy officer, he says, well, you know, it was those idiots in the Army and the civilians. They thought America was dominated by its women. And as soon as the war began, the women would demand that the war end, or whatever here. That's how 
sort of perverse a lot of the thinking was in Imperial Japan. Well, the Imperial Japanese don't hang around my household. That's all <laughs> I have to say. We are run by women, and it works just fine. Uh, Rich Frank, the book is Tower of Skulls. It's uh, the first volume of a intended trilogy. Intended. A History of the Asia Pacific War, July 37 to May 1942. Ladies and gentlemen, Rich Frank. Thank you. And now over to my pal Jeremy Collins. We're going to hand Rich over to the tender mercies of the crowd for Q&A. Any questions for? I've got a question for you, Rich, but I'm going to pass the mic to Dave Bergeron in the front row first. Thanks for the discussion. Uh, question, forecast for uh, volumes two and three. What, what are your uh, parameters for that? I was going to ask that. <laughs> Cloudy with a chance of showers and thunderstorms. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Uh, let me tell you, when I uh, uh, got the contract for the trilogy, we had set dates for the turn in of each volume. And uh, then came uh, COVID, and we, we moved the turn in date for volume two to July of next year, 2022. Roughly, you can usually count upon, you turn in a manuscript, and, and usually about a year later, the book appears or whatever, or somewhere in that range. And up until July of this year, uh, although a lot of troubles, I thought I was going to make the deadline for next year. But ultimately, what it comes down to is that, although I accumulated an enormous amount of research material that I've worked in, and there's a great deal of online material now that we have that we didn't have before, uh, still as you work along, you realize there are gaps or holes or things you need to go find out. It means you have to go to archives or whatever here. Well. The archives have been severely uh, restricted or closed. Travel has been a problem. And I haven't been able to get around to even the, the minimal list I've re reduced it to, to places I think I absolutely have to go. So I'm going to renegotiate with my editors soon about you know what is going to be realistic, which is still going to be kind of a, a shot in the dark. Believe me, no one wants to get this thing moved along more than I do at this point. And I do have. Um, well, the plan for volume two is a prologue in 16 chapters. I've got a prologue in about 10 of those chapters up in very finished drafts or whatever here, and sections of other things. But there's still places where I simply can't keep the quality up if I'm not able to go and do some of these archives or whatever. So it's not so much in my hands or my lack of due diligence. It's in the, in the hands of the U.S. National uh, Ar Archives Center or whatever yeah. here. COVID has caused problems all over the world. Yeah, but, but exactly. At least a little bit for historians, you know, uh, a, a yeah. little bit of sympathy. And I'm certainly not alone in this, and, I, and my editor is, uh, he's very understanding about this, and he has other other authors who are in the same same position. So if we can get through the pandemic or get back to some reasonable thing, then I expect to, uh, uh, basically they've allocated about two, two and a half, three years between volumes, so that was, that was a plan. That would be doable if the archives were open, in my view, but they're not open. So, Rich, the title of the book, is that in the reference to the countless millions of Chinese lost and all that, or what, where does, what is the reference of the, of the title? Oh, I, I, I love that question. Yeah, what, what happened was uh, I was reading uh, a, a, a book by Ari Hoda, who's done some really uh, excellent work. This particular book was Pan-Asianism and the uh, Asia-Pacific War. Uh, she also did a wonderful book called Japan 1941, which really gets into that conflict in the Japanese leadership in great detail, uh, including the Imperial Navy. And what she was recounting in that first book I mentioned was when Japan uh, gets into this large-scale war with China and gets into 1938, and it already internationally is well recognized that there are tremendous w losses in this war. And uh, there's a uh, uh, Indian, uh, Bengali Indian poet named Tagore, who was the first Indian to win the, uh, the uh, Nobel Prize in literature. And he's communicating with one of his good friends, who's a Japanese uh, poet, who by no means is sort of some crude nationalist, but the Japanese uh, uh, poet is trying to explain what Japan is really trying to achieve. And the Japanese you know, talk about liberating Asia for the Asians and things like that. They're really fighting Western colonialism. And Tagore gets that message from the Japanese poet, and he writes back in, in, in one searing sentence. He says, whatever you uh, believe you're trying to achieve, all you're really achieving is creating a tower of skulls. I read that line, and at that 
moment right there, I said, that's the title for this volume of the book. Good question. Yeah, thank you both gentlemen for a wonderfully learned conversation. Uh, Rich, I have a historian's question for you. <laughs> Uh, predictably. Uh, I read with my graduate student at UNO this past fall, the Global Cold War, sort of a very similar kind of project is used by Odd Arne Vestad, who is a Norwegian who speaks about ten languages. So since you mentioned uh, the Chiang Kai-shek diary and how it's changing everything, I assume that diary is translated. But my question is, as you are approaching the Asia-Pacific War as a big project as you are doing, how are you dealing with the languages of the Asia side? The Pacific side would be English, I assume. Right. That's an excellent question. And w actually, before embarking on this project, I sat down when I saw the full scope of this, and I said, what would be the uh, ideal qualifications for someone to embark on this? And I uh, listed five languages, uh, English, Chinese, Japanese, um, Russian, and certainly at least one other of the languages of the Far East. I said, and also expertise in military, diplomatic, economic, uh, social, uh, and uh, diplomatic relations or whatever here. And I had several other things. And I looked at that list and I said, I don't think there's anyone in the world who meets that requirement. <laughs> and I saw this huge story that hadn't been told and I thought, you know, uh, you know I always rate uh, historians, I give them a large uh, tick for uh, guts <laughs> being able to talk Time. But the, the other thing I turned back to was this. Uh, fortunately, thanks to my experience and, and work over the last couple decades, I have an absolutely fabulous group of colleagues on an international scale. And I've turned to them. With China in particular, there's a small cadre of Western and Chinese uh, historians who've worked in English or whatever here. And when I saw their material, I figured that that was more than enough for what I did and for these other things also. And there's enough stuff that's now available in English and Chinese. So I'm, I'm not... Uh, not linguistically, linguistically competent in all these languages that ideally I should be, but basically my defense is that uh, who is competent in everything like that better than I am? Uh, I, you know, I f fully concede my shortcomings. I just ask for everyone else to step forward and admit theirs. Rich, is John, John, John's memoirs out in English yet? No, or? not yet, not yet, not, not that I know of. Are these multi, is this a multi-volume oh, diary? Right, of right, right. You know. 15 volumes. Yeah, and one of the things I point out, one of the things I learned early on in, in working with the Japanese official history series is that um, one of the post-war reforms in Japan was to simplify written uh, uh, Japanese characters out of here. And that's been the standard in Japan ever since 1940, since shortly after the war, whatever here. All Japanese are educated in that. But that history volume is published with the main text and the revised characters. But when they quote wartime era documents, they use the older characters. And you can literally look at the page and see the difference. And I was very fortunate enough to have this very skilled translator I work with when I went through those page by page. And he was pointing out to me that, you know, and he had been educated uh, pre-war. In fact, he was on the, he was on the uh, pipeline to become a kamikaze pilot when the war ended, whatever here. Um, and if you can go online, you can see uh, on the street interviews of uh, contemporary Japanese, and they show them the old characters, and uh, very few of them can give a fluid, nuanced reading to those characters. That's one of the many complications of, of, of dealing with. Plus, when people are handwriting characters or whatever here. So it's, my hat's off to people who are multilingual or whatever, but that's not what I am. One more question. Jeremy, there's also one in the two. middle, too, if you can. We'll maybe two. And then we can do two. Yeah. Hi, Great, Rich. Thanks. Thank you very much, gentlemen. A uh, question for you about the problems of getting the supplies into Western China, flying the hump. Can you also elaborate on the problems of just getting the supplies to India and how that worked? Um, the short answer is it didn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, once, once the Japanese cut off the Burma Road, uh, the Burma Road was actually a, a it started in the port of Rangoon, a rail link up to Lashio, and then a road route uh, across into China or whatever. And the Japanese seized all of Burma, including Rangoon. So from that point onward, uh, American supplies trying to reach China had to be sh sent by ship uh, 
from usually the U.S. East Coast around until well into 1943, around Africa because the Mediterranean was cut off, and then around, and the, the uh, principal port used for the first about two years was Karachi, which is now actually in Pakistan, on the west coast of what was then India. And then it was loaded on trains that had to change gauge three times that went over unbridged rivers where the trains had to be broken down and put on, on uh, barges to shuttle across or whatever here. So we figured that the time, and we use this in the to Red Tokyo exhibit, the time it takes to get a widget from New York City to the airfields in uh, western Assam, in, in western India, was 109 days, and then flown over the hump. And that also means that a, a, a ship that was going on the route from the U.S. East Coast to India, that basically says the ship can only do a couple of voyages a year uh, to do that. So the, the time factors on turnaround of shipping, which was critical, were just astronomically awful for doing China. That's you know the basic reason why. Uh, and when you break down the total U.S. Lend-Lease effort in World War II, uh, uh, roughly the figures I've seen, it's about 62% go to the British Commonwealth, including obviously the U.K., Australians, and whatever. About 25% goes to the Soviet Union. Uh, about 5% goes to the Free French. About 4% goes to China, mm. and whatever here. And the great majority, of, as I mentioned, great majority of the supplies reaching China over the hump uh, arrive after January of 1944. And we think we have supply chain issues yeah, today. Well, right. That's incredible. Right. Last yeah. question is straight ahead in the center. A statistical question. What is the number of the Japanese uh, casualties in China? Uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, I just saw a, a, rev uh, a new set of numbers that came out of uh, from a Japanese historian, and um, I think the total number of fatalities uh, is like 438,000 for all eight years. Um, and of course, and you figure there's several wounded for every, because that was one place where the Imperial Japan was fighting, where they would have wounded and the wounded would survive. Fighting in the Pacific and uh, Burma, their wounded seldom survived or whatever here. And of that number, he has some rather startling numbers about the number that are disease deaths, which go from uh, a fair fraction to over half in the second half of the last four years of the war. So there's this enormous amount of uh, death rate in, in Japanese military forces that die from uh, disease in China. So it's about two million total casualties, maybe something like yeah, that for eight years of war? Uh, yeah, for total Japanese military services, total casualties, you usually put about 2 million, 2.1 million, somewhere very close to that range. So there's uh, only a, you know, and the Chinese are in it for eight years and they cover a little more than a, a fifth or whatever here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard Robb, and a fabulous event. We certainly don't appreciate today. Uh, we've got, let's first give them a round of applause. So uh, we, we've got another amazing program in, in 30 minutes at 345, 1545 military time. Well, we've got a panel fe featuring our own historians from the Institute. That's them right there. and. Uh, so, so don't forget about that. Now, Rich will also be here signing copies of his uh, books uh, for the folks that are interested in that. Uh, obviously, uh, two and three of the trilogy aren't out yet. You've got to wait for those. But you know, maybe he'll take IOUs on the signing of that. And then uh, the, the, the rest of the, the, so we have 345 is our panel. Uh, at 5 p.m., we've got a reception. And then at 6, we're going to launch another program with uh, Chris Capazzola in a conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Steph Hinterschitz about his book, Bound by War, about the U.S. and Filipino relationship, which will be uh, incredibly interesting as well. So with that, thanks for coming. See you back here at 345, and uh, that's it. Great.